Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 You will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club, I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Like the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's DR6 8AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number, that's 01453 isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group, that's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well... They need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? Twenty? Eighteen. And should we put in the age range that's thirteen to twenty-two? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. 
We need to buy the materials, though. Oh, OK. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least £50. OK. And what else? Oh, I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is, if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a teacher helping high school students visiting from an overseas school to fill in a school excursion permission note. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, students. My name is Mrs Brown, and I'm in charge of the school excursion next week. Please take out your school excursion permission note so you can fill it in. For insurance purposes, this note must be signed by your guardian or the group leader. First of all, fill in the name of your class. Everyone here is in 3A, aren't they? So write 3A where it says class. We're going to the Blue Mountains, which is great. So this is the school excursion to the Blue Mountains. The day we leave is Monday. That's Monday, June 10. We are travelling by bus all the way. So we don't have to worry about changing trains or anything like that. The bus will leave from the front gate at 8 a.m. I know we usually use the side gate, but because of the roadworks, we will be using the front gate when we leave. However, when we return, the roadwork will be complete, so we'll use the side gate. We expect to be back at 6 p.m. It's going to be a lovely day. Your teachers will give you tasks to do when we arrive. We'll provide fruit and fruit juice on the bus. But you must bring your own lunch. While we're on the excursion, we'll be moving around a lot in some fairly rough country. Be very careful to wear strong shoes. 
It's very important that you look after your feet very well. Now, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. No questions? OK, I'd just like to fill in a few more details. The bus should arrive in the Blue Mountains at 11am. We'll have time to do the first of our tasks before lunch. The bus is not a new one, but it does carry one piece of special equipment, a first aid kit. I certainly hope we won't have to use it, but it's nice to know it's there in case we have a medical emergency. The other class on this excursion is 3B, so I know it'll be a good day. The last time 3A and 3B went out together was a thoroughly successful excursion. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange. Blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed 12 containers overboard. Inside the containers were 29,000 plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things. 
but it would be too expensive to drop 29,000 bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up in Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship. Some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me, hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women. And children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii; others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington and Oregon. Can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So, keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. We'll hear a speech by the student union vice president for finance. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now you will hear the speech. Hello, as VP of Finance, my job is to oversee the spending of our grant to ensure that all areas of student union activity run efficiently and smoothly, without any financial headaches. I have a thoroughly efficient finance team. Ursula, Ella, and Henrik, we are all here to help you as best as we can. Remember, 
that even though I administer the union's finances, it is ultimately you who has the final say in expenditure policy, either directly through the democratic process of the general meetings or by voicing your opinions through the Executive Finance Committee. I would like to take this opportunity to thank last year's VP Finance, Martin Curry, for his excellent work in improving the financial running of the union to what it is today. Finally, remember to enjoy yourself and to use the union facilities and services to the full. And if you're still not satisfied, come and let us know why. Extra note, in order to maximise my time as VP Finance and to give a more efficient service to students, the Finance Office will only be open to students from 11 o'clock a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. and 2 o'clock p.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. The Cashier's Office will be open from 12 o'clock noon to 2 o'clock p.m. daily. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.